for the images <clears throat> because they're hard images to look at. Um, there's a banker in Chicago, his name's Ed Williams, a Chinese and black brother from Mississippi. Uh, Ed Williams uh, collected these objects whenever he and his wife would travel. Um, antique shops on the East Coast, up the coast, New Hampshire, out of the country, China, Japan, Germany, wherever he was over 40 years. And he collected them in a way to, uh, he said, he would say to remove them from the market so that they couldn't be traded in all white spaces anymore. Part of the success of uh, Ed's life was that he could pass as not black, he looked Chinese, just had a big nose. He looked like a big nose Chinese, by the way. Um, but Ed got to 75, he retired from banking, and he had amassed this collection of uh, over seven or 8,000 objects and paper things. And he thought that this legacy, he would give it to his family. Um, but it's a hard legacy to inherit. And um, his, his daughters and his son um, could identify in a more complicated way, a different kind of complicated blackness. And they didn't want to raise their kids around these images. And so Ed find himself, found himself with an inheritance that nobody wanted, a legacy that, that was hard to hold on to. And so we found each other. and, and um, I became the kind of manager of, of these, these objects. And um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of context. And then it was out of um, that set of uh, images and paper things that a series of scores uh, were there. And I thought, Elena, maybe you could talk about um, some of the content. Um, that you received and, and how that process worked and how you came to um, choosing those songs. Sure. Um, I received about 20 of the pieces. Some of them were piano pieces. A lot of them vocal with piano or there was some for banjo, ukulele. Um, and I took the ones that, um, well, I didn't use the piano scores much because I don't do that. You do very good at that. Um, I, I took the ones really that um, for me evoked um, this little conflict that I found um, in the music regarding Mammy especially. Um, and the great thing was, you know, Theaster basically said, hey, do what you like here. So. Um, 
those are the ones that, for me, created the greatest amount of conflict when I, when I looked at them and I, I started to work on them. So, of course, I wanted to go for that because <laughs> that's kind of how I roll. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just in thinking about the composers of this music, I, I looked into it and I thought, well, certainly they were from a certain part of the South, but no, they were from New York and Ohio and Chicago. And it was basically the pervasive thought that this is the popular way to represent black Americans. And so, you know, with that, I went into the scores. I, I found what was resonating with me. It was that conflict between the mammy that you love and long for so much, um, you know, because of what she potentially gave or what she represents. Um, this music that, you know, it's kind of folksy. Um, yeah, and, and the, the stereotypical horror that is also connected there. So that's where I'm coming from. Right on. Mm -hmm. um, the, the words in one of the songs is rock me, rock me mammy. Mm -hmm. And this, this guy is recounting his youth white dude with his black uh, caregiver mm -hmm. and kind of longing for the South again, longing for those days again, now that he's moved into his, his other world. Um, that there's, there's actually no, uh, there's no way to have to embody that music. You know, it, it, it kind of automatically triggers things. And I think that, you know, part of what I've been kind of invested in is, is um, what does it mean for those songs to come not through a white minstrel mimicking black culture, you know, but what, what would it mean for us to um, make resonant, uh, invisible, inaudible again, these weird songs and these weird images um, to the point where I also had difficulty looking at the images and, and was not quite sure anymore why I had put this together, you know? Mm -hmm. That it was just kind of like, this is really jacked up. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a complicated set of things. But to sing it is to embody it as the, as the author had intended, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, um, you know, I thought I'd kind of maybe also ask you, Samuel, and, and Michael, what does it mean to embody a music that wasn't necessarily made for you, but about you in the most derogatory of terms, and then kind of what's on your mind as you're kind of playing that music? Um, well, there's a complete mixture of emotions, I think, uh, especially anytime somebody sees images like this for the first time. Um, so um, I think in particular, um, I don't know if they saw the salt shaker, uh, but um, there's uh, an image of a salt shaker that is equally kind of uh, deriding and hateful as any of the images that we've shown. And just to think that this could be sitting on somebody's kitchen table every day, you know, three times, you know, three times a day, they just deal with this like uh, kind of monument of <laughs> of hatred, like um, just. Uh, so bringing that to life in a, in, a, in a musical way without allowing it to uh, kind of corrupt and not give it power over me, but at the same time um, give, uh, give a, 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 a view into, uh, I think Monk had a tune called Ugly Beauty. Um, and 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 just it, the the duality of these things that the, these are kind of everyday kind of objects, a can of beans, or you know, uh, um, just a, a poster, or even all down to shackles and, and pieces of music um, that all had this thread through it. So really, my thing is trying to present 
old in a different context. Um, so what kind of spoke to me was uh, taking maybe folk um, uh, songs and traditional uh, spiritual things as kind of a basis um, and using a different chordal and rhythmic context um, to show the dissonance that had to be uh, involved in just being present when these objects were around. So. I mean, hello? Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to think about this for about four or five years. <laughs> 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 um, well, my mom's, my mom was white. My dad is black. My mom's German Polish descent, and uh, grew up in Wisconsin. And in the house, there was a collection of these objects. I never really knew what the function of the collection was. It wasn't like um, there's this relationship, particularly in Wisconsin, of art. This relationship with art that it's like a tactile thing arts and crafts, you know, so, like I bring my dad to the Astor studio and he just starts touching everything. <laughs> He's like, what's this made of, dad, please? Like, <laughs> I don't want to like, it's in there. I don't want to have to take a loan. <laughs> um, but this idea of, you know, uh, my entire mom's side of the family made crafts and do craft fairs on Saturdays, sometimes Sundays. And you, you know, you see something that someone made with their hands and you pick it up. That's, that's the relationship with art for the most case, I would say, growing up for, uh, for me. So we would have these objects that looked like arts and crafts, but meant something else in the house. But um, there's a general relationship with these, these objects specifically that growing up, we would go to craft fairs and people would reproduce some of um, some of these objects or objects up like this, objects like this in that vein. And uh, if you're talking about music about you, but not for you, um, that would always mess me up a little bit. Like I said, I would have to, I have to stew on this to really come up with an answer. I can only talk on my own experience, but like someone, someone who doesn't look like me making an object that offends me, but they're making it in the now and they don't understand that its relationship to themselves or to me or the country, they don't, it's just an object. Um, and what do you do with that? As a, as a kid, you just digest, but as an adult, what do you do with that moment? Um, you know, what do you do when you wear the Cleveland Indians hat, you know? Yeah. As an adult, what do you, how do you deal with that? I, d I don't have an answer. Um, there's a brother named uh, W.J.T. Mitchell. He's, he's a professor at University of Chicago. He wrote this book on, on images, kind of a seeing, a book on seeing. And there's an area where he's talking about uh, black objects. And he said, you know, the producer, the non-black producer of some of these objects is making with both fear and fetish. They're both horrified and turned on, like this kind of duality in the making of the thing, in the production of the thing, but also in talking about the history of, um, say, the white American imagination around these things. And I'm really, in a way, testing, testing this conversation with us all. Um, but this idea that, uh, in, in some ways, the fetish object was made, or the cookie jar, or the salt shaker was made as a way of grappling with the thing that you both loved and was afraid of, um, uh, wanted to have a close and intimate encounter with, but, but for all of the taboo reasons, um, couldn't. And so, so these objects became a kind of uh, middle ground by which one could express their um, deep desire, right? And, and so, uh, in a way, they're different from abstract expressionism or things that we might see, see here uh, at the Hirschhorn. But when I think about um, the larger constellation of museums in DC, uh, I would not be surprised if many of these things live in the basements and lower basements and anti-basements of, of those spaces. 
And in some ways, it is as much a part of the visual American experience as, um, you know, the Jasper Johns. Or, or, and, and so, so I, I thank you guys for um, trusting one another and, 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 and trying to make this work. Um, Samuel, before, before, you know, this is some behind the scenes. Earlier, you used the word impressionistic when you were talking about a, a mode of playing. And I, I was kind of struck by that because it sounded like I didn't know if, if musicians, excuse me, musicians, if musicians <laughs> use uh, what seemed like an art genre word. Would you, de can you describe impressionistic playing? It's also period. Yeah. Music. Yes. Yeah. It, it, can you talk about that? I mean, when I think about um, impressionistic playing, um, I think about using color musically as opposed to um, shapes, for example, because you have harmonic shapes. And, um, and so when I'm playing something that's impressionistic, it tends to uh, be more formless and m more kind of difficult to um, pin down to one harmonic center. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that, especially with the mix of emotions that one gets looking at these pictures, I didn't want to hit the nail right on the head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the um, offensive picture comes up and the big diminished chord at the bottom of the piano would be like really obvious. Um, and um, especially seeing that a lot of these things, once again, were daily used things. Um, so um, just trying to uh, play both the strong and weak side of something simultaneously or play the, um, like the ugly, the light and the dark mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, and uh, trying to make those two sides have some sense of balance um, and by doing so, um, having a uh, liking to like like the visual uh, rep representation, a kind of unfinished, uh, unsettled, but balanced mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I like. I mean, that the first couple words after impressionistic are shape and color, you know, mm -hmm. and that and that uh, maybe in a way, artists, whether they're you know, you know, maybe I'm trying to make this case th that we grab, that we may be grappling in similar ways. You know, um, that there are times when one wants to be un not preoccupied with uh, form. You know, you just want to go out a bit, and it, and it feels it feels that way in the work. There was a moment where you were back and forth in your solo between something that like. It was like that Southern, like it would be like, oh, you know, and it was just like quick, you know. And it's like, well, what is it that makes a thing sound Southern? Like, dun 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 dun. dun. Like, is there like a a kind of um, there's a there's a set of sounds in my head that triggers Southern freedom, sorrow, mourning, you know. And it was so beautiful to hear. You, you know, hear you moving, moving through those things. Uh, but then, you know, Michael, you were disrupting that in a way or interrupting that. And I was, I was hoping you'd maybe talk about like all those gadgets, um, <laughs> you know, and- uh, I just, uh, I just steal my daughter's cho toys. <laughs> That's all it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know. To piggyback on what you're saying, I, as a drummer, I'm less interested in rhythm mm -hmm. and more interested in color and textures. 
um, color, textures, density, and form. Um, one of my first heroes as a drummer was Max Roach, who has this, who's had this brilliant way of improvising, and it just felt like a story. It was like building blocks, instead of you know, like instead of like a paint swipe, it was like building blocks. He just pulled out this color block and then this color block, and they just moved from one to the other so brilliantly. But it was like, boom, boom, statement, symbols, drums, snare drum. It was just like, and it wasn't jagged, you know? And I've spent the last 25 years trying to figure out what the hell he's doing. <laughs> um, you know, I play a lot of drum set, a lot of different bands, and you know, I was trying to find excuses to get off the drums because it makes me feel really uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's important of like, you know, something like this where, you know, you travel playing with a dear friend, for a dear friend, meeting new people, audience coming. You know, you might want to go with comfort first. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to like, for me at least, to just keep an edge on there of not having a different configuration um, whenever possible, just to disrupt any flow that I have and have to deal with the immediate now, the objects in front of me, to hopefully have something new come out of that, find something different out of that each time. So if that's and you're racing any idea of instruments. So mm -hmm. if it's a vibrating toothbrush, it's a vibrating toothbrush because instruments vibrate to make sound. Sustaining on drums is a hard thing to do unless you're rolling. Vibrating toothbrush with percussion instruments allows me to sustain like a saxophone player or something, you know. Just approaching everything equally. Tables, water bottles, microphones, chairs. It's just like, what, what can these things do? Especially as percussionists, um, everything makes sound for me. So everything's game. So. Right on. So um, some of you guys might know this, but Elaine and I went to undergrad together. And I don't know if I listened to any operatic music before meeting Elena. And, um, that it was just not something, unless it was like Tom and Jerry, you know, like Figaro, which was great. It was great. <laughs> um, but I, I probably used to tease you, if not to your face, behind your back, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the culture of the music department in that world was so different. And, uh, and if, you know, if I was like, oh, well, what'd you do? It was like, oh, I'm learning this, you know, some other German, you know? And it's really beautiful music, listen to this, and I'd be like, uh-huh, that's really beautiful, you know? And then I would go back to like gospel choir rehearsal, you know? And there were like these kind of these two worlds, you know, and and um, the Esther had great hair then. I had great hair then. It was really great. nice. <laughs> but I remember thinking about um, I remember uh, conversations about how white the classical music form felt to me, and then um, us talking over years about casting four parts and not being able to cast for a part because that person had a different visual profile and that a director would be um, looking for a particular kind of look even though Elena had the voice of the thing, she didn't have the racial profile or otherwise. And so, and so it was not the voice, but it was like this kind of commitment to a white script like, oh, that woman is like cute and little, and and you can, or you can't be tall. You're the chambermaid. You can't be taller than the main uh, actor on stage, right? And I just remember, I might be making this up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. One of my it made 
made me mad. <laughs> One of my very favorite directions, you know, you get notes after you rehearse from a director of an actual show. Elena, can you just be a little shorter? <laughs> this, it, I can't make that up. Like, no, it's true. Yeah. It's true. And so, you know, I wonder, what, like, you know, there's, and then there's like, but Elena, you should be singing like, you know, anyway, like all these other musics, right? And so, I, I mean, since not all of us know your roots, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, your growth in music, your history with music, and how, how you came to make the music that you make. Um, so, DC is my home. My family is here. Everyone's here. Um, thank you for coming. And so I started musically at birth, pretty much. I think it was my first language. Um, my father was um, a musician in the Church of God in Christ. And we basically sang all the time. In fact, um, when I was maybe four-ish, I was very upset with him. Apparently, he gave my solo to my aunt. And yeah, so I believed it was mine because I would sing it all the time at home. And then we got to church to sing it with the choir and everybody in the band. And Auntie Nona gets up. And I was like, no. that's not how it's <laughs> So yeah, it was, that was the beginning. And um, uh, singing all through school. I started studying classically um, later in high school. Um, and, and that's where things kind of changed, I think. I think the, where you find, you know, a little bit of Discomfort maybe is where I I really I found my groove. It's, you know, the the classical repertoire is is pretty amazing to me, and I, I love it. Um, of course, though, since then there have been so many opportunities for other types of music, for for jazz, for um, Argentine music, for tangos. Um, for coming to this, um, that was really something. Um, but yeah, that's, you, that's the history. Do you ever run into, like, there's the, the, the issue of and it, the other way around? A musician said once, a drummer just moved to town, moved to Chicago. And he was describing him to me, and he's like, he sounds great. You know, he's got that real black way of playing. Oh. And I was like, I, I, that messed me up so much. I was like, I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't know what that, yeah. so it's like, whatever that is that you think that is, I'm going to try to fight that. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I'm going to fight you right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't even know what that means, and there's, there's the risk of being a novelty. Um, um, I guess my question is, like, being a black female opera singer, um, similar to in, in the jazz world, the the genderization of general uh, gender gender lie gender generalization yeah, gender. genderization. Gen are you talking about genders? I don't or listen to enough to NPR. What is <laughs> genderization. Genderization. Genderizing instruments. Uh, yes. <laughs> so band directors, oh you know, it's like girls over here. Mm -hmm. Girls play flute and clarinet. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. Boys play trombone, mm -hmm. saxophone, and in jazz, tr saxophones, trumpets, basses, drums. Those are the instruments that are fundamental in a lot of the music. So it's a, it's a male. It's a smelly locker room. Yeah. So so a female jazz musician often fights with the novelty of I'm I'm female and I play bass. It's like fight, you get a lot of opportunities, but you might, you're fighting with that because you might be getting opportunities because it's 
it's one of those, you mm -hmm. know, in someone else's eyes. I'm just, mm -hmm. my question is like, do you ever run into that? Yeah, yeah, there, there was a period um, probably 10 years ago, more than that, maybe 12-ish, um, when I completely changed my wardrobe. <laughs> I started looking for floral dresses, thinking, oh, well, if I could look more sort of what you were describing, like somebody's niece that they might recognize, they might see as the, you know what I mean, ingenue, what have you. Um, it didn't last too long. <laughs> but that's definitely a thing that happens, for sure. Um, How do you deal with it? Um, I On a personal level, really, I guess. Well, that's the thing. I, I attempted to change a something, and that's, that's impossible, really. Like, the authentic me is not going to do that. The authentic me is going to look at whatever music I'm doing and getting to that. Like, I can't, I can't, you know, shape shift. I can't put on a different makeup. I, you know, I like the heels. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? It's just the package is there. If you are interested in it, that's great. This is where I am now. Um, there's definitely been um, an evolution to that, but yeah. yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Elena Lewis, Samuel Prather, and Michael Avery. <laughs>